this, we're going to start by looking at some of the myths. And I can talk about these myths because many of them were indeed in my thinking. I, this is exactly how I thought. And until I found myself in the throes of deep grief and realized, wow, I was wrong. No wonder I didn't understand. All right, the first one I've kind of referred to, and that's the idea that many of us have, particularly in North America, that grieving is a bad thing, that it's bad. Now, I will quickly admit it is a negative experience, but to say that it's bad is no, it's, it's the same as saying, if you cut your arm and it hurts, that hurt is bad. No, it's, it's a good thing. You want the pain because the pain tells you something's wrong and you can do something about it. Grief, the, the, the pain of grief is an emotional version of a, like the physical part of it. And I liken it to that a lot, that if I cut my arm and I, then I'm going to uh, feel some pain and I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to, uh, I want it to heal. And I know it's not going to heal immediately. It's going to take some time. And I'm going to have to do something like clean it and address it and take care of it, watch for infection. And so there's things I need to do. It's not, the pain isn't bad. It was ne negative, but not bad. Grief is not, I had the idea that it was bad. That it's, and something bad, you want to avoid at all costs. You want to get away from it. You want to run from it. It's, you know, anybody that experiences it, it's, there's something wrong there. And no, grief, I had to, I realized, even though grief, the subject of grief is a negative thing, it's not a bad thing uh, for, for us to consider. Another one, of course, and, and this one here, I secretly believed that people who grieved were weak. Now, some of that is cultural. I'll be talking about culture at another session, but some of that was cultural, that the, the strong tough it out, the strong buck it up, and anybody who actually grieved was weak. And I had to realize, you know what? Once this happened to me, and I couldn't control my emotions, my, the sobs would hit me out of nowhere, and there was nothing I could do about it, I had to realize well, I'm either really weak or my thinking was wrong. And I began to realize, no, it was my thinking that was wrong. It's not, weak, grieving is not a sign of weakness. And that's one of the myths that I think many times uh, are a hindrance to us in understanding that. As a Christian, this one, this one was strong for me too. I remember actually thinking this before, you know, about other people before my first wife died, that grieving shows a lack of trust in God. If I really trusted God, then it didn't matter how, 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 what negative things happen, it, I, it wouldn't bother me. And I, once I found myself grieving, I realized, wow, this hurt is really increasing my trust, not challenging it. I'm actually tr able to trust God more now because I've gone through this grief and He's sustained me. And it was just the opposite of what I thought before. I thought that somebody who was grieving was, was demonstrating a, a, weak, a, a lack of trusting in God. When my experience was I actually, my faith actually increased during my grieving process. And so my, the myth that I believed was so out of balance. And uh, so as I went through this, of course, even to the point of thinking that grieving actually could be classified as sin. You know, somebody that's spiritually weak, they're sinning and they need to get their heart right with God so they don't, and stop this grieving stuff. When really, it's, you know, that was a myth that I had to overcome. And so I, it, what it does, it helps me understand the grieving process. When someone else grieves, I view what's going on differently than I did before because I had so many myths, so many perspectives about the grieving process that were not right and just uh, needed, needed some, uh, some correction. This one is a huge one, partially for me. Now I'll be talk because of my personality. Now we'll be talking in another session about how different personalities deal with the grieving process. But my type A type personality, it was like, okay, I want to do this and get it over with. 
And many people, I find, that's the, how they view grieving. Well, did he grieve? Yeah, I saw him cry once. Okay, he grieved. Uh, grieving is not an event. It is a process. Something people work through, um, not do once and be done with it. And so many folks, I feel uh, that's that even by listening to them talk, did he grieve or not? I don't think he's. I don't think he grieved yet. Well, I saw him cry once. No, not necessarily. So it, that's an important point for you to keep in mind that grieving is a process, not an event. I've actually had pastors call me looking for help with someone in their church who'd experienced loss. Um, and those pastors obviously viewed, well, this person, he, they, sh they grieved back here. They should be over it now they, because they already grieved. No, it's not an event, not an event that happened at the funeral, not an event that happened the day the, the death took place. It is a process. And it is one illustration I'm thinking of, the, uh, it was a, a lady who had lost her husband suddenly, and they, uh, later, late in life, and they were dependent on one another heavily, and it had been three months, and he felt like that she had, had, wasn't moving on. I, and I says, three months? pastor to her it just happened it's not an event that happened at the funeral it's a process and you're gonna to have to uh, give this lady some time he says well will you, will you help me so I did that and by by the, within about six or seven months the lady was was uh, working through that and in fact <laughs> The whole story is she actually got a hold of me and got six copies of the books. She's giving them out to other people to help them out, and she's doing quite well. But at first, you see what I'm saying? At first, the pastor still had the idea it, grieving was an event. I thought she did that. It's three months later. How come she's still struggling? He didn't understand that the process of grief. He saw it as an event uh, that took place. Now, this one was an interesting one that uh, happened to me after my second wife died. I saw this to be the case. And this, I understand, I've heard people in churches talking, you know, in other words, the, if somebody shows grief in public, that means they're not doing well. And I've even talked to grievers who felt that way. And they says, well, okay, now don't talk to me about that. I don't want to put on a show. Uh, implying I'm not doing well. Here's what happened to me. About three months, within the first three months after my second wife died, <clears throat> I would have the freedom, because I was working through the process, to talk about where I was in the grieving process, talk about her, and even in public shed a tear if, that, if it happened to happen. And I wasn't ashamed to do that, and it was actually, for me, healing. A person in our church saw that happen a time or two. And their conclusion was, oh, he's crying in public still. <clears throat> he must be having trouble. So they got a hold of another gentleman older than me who had lost his wife a few months before me, who happened to be a hospice chaplain, and said, hey, would you hook up, with, get together with this guy and have, have lunch? So we did that. Don and I got together and had, had lunch. And we got to chatting, and so I'm sitting there sharing my process, the things that I'm learning, and going through what I was understanding about grief and where I saw myself in the process and what I'd learned. And about two-thirds through of the meal, he stopped and leaned back. He says, okay, I'm going to be honest. I was recommended to talk to you because the person referring me thought you weren't doing very well. I'll be honest with you. You've taught me some things. I think you're better farther along in the process than I am. Thank you for that. And I, it's like, oh, yeah, you know what? That is sometimes the case, that when we see somebody who's grieving express it publicly, we somehow think that that means they're not doing well. When for me, actually, it was evidence that I was doing well. I was allowing the process to happen and not stuffing it, which would have been de uh, devastating. So a big myth that oftentimes comes out there. Another one is that, <clears throat> another myth that I've had and heard 
is that grief always follows a predictable path. Any deviation from that is big trouble. If you deviate from this path, then you, you, you're having trouble, you need counseling, you need to be put away or something, whatever. Uh, I, my experience with the grieving process, and we'll go through some of these processes in other classes coming up, but um, for example, here's my, one of my illustrations personally, how that I deviated from the pattern but it wasn't, there wasn't anything wrong. With my first wife, one of, the sub, one of the issues that sometimes comes up in some death situations is the subject of guilt. That somehow the griever feels a certain level of guilt of some kind. Sometimes it's the survivor guilt. Some, why am I, how come I didn't die instead of them? Sometimes I, maybe I could have done more and they wouldn't have died. If I had called the doctor sooner or some, some kind of a guilt issue. Or like me, just the guilt of a broken relationship and it hurts. My experience with grief with, in, in, with, grief with my first wife Guilt happened last. It was the very last hurdle. I had no guilt. Our relationship was textbook. They, you know, God was working there, and, and it, I didn't feel any guilt whatsoever and, through the whole thing until the very, very end. And what I realized looking back is that guilt was, was uh, a result of a broken relationship. My lover was gone, and the relationship was broken. And that little bit of guilt came from that, that last hurt. And how I actually got released from that, and I'll go ahead and tell you here, um, and it's not just for everybody necessarily to go through this. I felt like <clears throat> because of the love, rela love relationship was broken, I felt like I needed to say I'm sorry to my wife. And I, how can I do that? You know, whenever there's a relationship between two, uh, two lovers that, br that break down, somebody, to, for the relationship to restore, somebody says, has to say, I'm sorry. Well, how could I do that? So what I did, I drove to the cemetery, went to the gravesite where she was buried. I knelt down and I pr looked up to heaven and I says, Lord, I can't talk to Ruth, but you can. Would you tell her I'm sorry? And my guilt was gone. That was my first experience. My second wife, guilt was the first thing that I dealt, dealt with. Because my second wife was a person that uh, words of affirmation were very strong to her. To, to, for me to, it was very, very important for, her, for me to, to reinforce her and to tell her positive things and so forth. And suddenly after she died, I was wondering, did I tell her I loved her enough? Maybe I should have done it more. And I started feeling guilty that maybe somehow I hadn't said I love you enough in life. And I had to work through that. I deviated from a process. I mean, it's one time it was the beginning and the other. Other, other people, I have a good friend who's, who um, actually were co-associates uh, with an organization, and I found out that his wife had died, so I called him to, to talk to him. And in the course of the conversation, I found out that his wife had actually committed suicide, and that had not been public information. And so he was telling me about that. And, and so we t chatted, and I said, well, let me call you again. You know, we had a nice conversation. Uh, about three to six weeks later, I called Bob back again. And I says, say, Bob, how you doing? And we talked, and he says, doing pretty good. He says, that, did people say things to you that were kind of off the wall? <laughs> I said, Bob, they did. Uh, he, he says, like what? He says, well, I've had people come up to me and tell me that, you know, uh, counsel me that, I, you know, that my anger is okay. He says, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. Why are they telling me I'm angry? I'm not mad. And uh, so, and so that some people were thinking, well, he's not dealing with it right because he's not angry. They had this thing in their mind that it had to be a certain way. Another uh, real clear example of this one was I actually had some relatives that, that came up to me and says, well, you know, you don't want to make any decisions whatsoever of any kind of change or anything at all for uh, at least one year. I says, really, where'd you get that? 
because uh, I, after nine months, I had made a, a decision to, to move, actually. And they thought that was, I was deviating from the pattern that they had in their mind that had to be a certain way. And so, I, anyway, so sometimes that's the case. So I, I began to realize that sometimes those myths come into play and, and how people respond to the grieving process, either themselves or with how they treat or view those who are going through the grieving process. This is kind of a repeat of the other one. However, it includes e the emotions that people who are grieving are spiritually weak or actually immature and emotionally very, very weak. And I saw that happen. Actually, um, our first, after, before my first wife died, a co-worker at the school I was teaching at died a year earlier. And his widow was struggling, going through the grieving process, and the, the other staff members, including me, thought she was struggling with that. Uh, and actually began to kind of, behind her back, shake their head, tisk tisk, she must be really weak or whatever. And uh, I even f remember thinking that, oh yeah, she really is, wow, here it's been all, so many months and she still can't show herself in public or whatever, wh whatever we're viewing. And because I viewed her as emotionally weak because she was grieving. And after it happened to me, I looked back and thought, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> uh, I really was judging her improperly because I had a, the myth about me that she must be emotionally weak and that's not necessarily the case. Now this one is a very strong myth about the grieving process that I've run into both times at both when I, my first wife died when my second wife died I came across this myth for sure and that's the idea that a griever in order to comfort somebody who's grieving I need to say or do something that will fix your grieving. That when I walk away, you're better. Or you're over it now. Because I did this or said this to you. And I, you know, I've had people actually come up to me and say, well, I always say this to a griever. Be, and with the, with the idea that, because that's going to fix them. You know, what kind of a thing. Listen, grievers will don't get the help from people that come along to try to fix their grief you can't do that it's grief is not something that's going to get fixed and we'll talk about that later and here's the other one that i'm getting and this is where the responses i got from the, the book that you that you're actually reading is many people say well i don't want to say the wrong thing and make it worse or i don't want to make them cry Listen, after each of my wives died, there was nothing anybody could say that would have made my grief worse. Nothing. Your comments, even if it was stupid, would not make my grief deeper than it was. So, I'm not saying that you can't say the wrong thing. You can say stuff that are stupid and not a help to somebody and maybe make them mad or pull them, make them, but as far as making their grief deeper and hurt worse than ever, probably you're not able to do that. Uh, so, not, 